That's cool. So, I guess for anyone coming in, I am the I am the instructor tonight. This is the talk on the crash course into addressables and how they're really stupid easy, and I will do my best to watch my language. And also how to use addressables for content updates. I guess you say the moderators on this panel are uh, Steven and David, who, if, if they want to watch, volunteer to watch the chat, if people ask questions, I'll let them interrupt me to ask questions. Otherwise, I will not pay attention to any chat whatsoever because I cannot multitask. Got you. Do we Let's have see. a chat related to this? Eh. YouTube, I think. The Twitch chat. I think it's going. So, to check that. We have about five minutes till we'll get started. Um, how's my audio sound? Is this good? Perfect. Excellente. Let's see. So, I know I'm just going to like be rambling about addressables, and the reason why I I know so much about addressables is that uh, my day job required me to learn it, so I did. And addressables documentation is it's not bad. It's certainly not good either. Um, metaphorically speaking, addressable documentation is like imagine you went back in time and you found like an ancient Roman and you said, "Here's a car." I'm like, what's a car? It's like, oh, it's like a horseless carriage. And he's and they say, oh, how how do I how does it work? And you just give them a driver's ed manual. So they read that that book and now it's like great. They know to not cross the double yellow line. They know to turn right on the red. Red means stop. Green means go. But no point in that book does it actually tell them to take metal key, insert into car, turn 15 degrees to ignite engine. You know, that's the problem with the addressable documentation. It assumes you already know what you're doing. And so it gives you all the advanced stuff. So this is a crash course into like, this is how the average person can use addressables and read documentation after this. So with that in mind, uh, Steven and Dave, I know both of you guys say that like uh, you haven't either you haven't used addressables or you tried to and couldn't figure it out. Is there anything that like in particular that like you have questions beforehand? So I'll keep that in my mind while like I go over it. What is an addressable? Excellent. Definitely cover that one. For me, it was labels. Cool. Definitely. I'll go. I'll make sure to go over that then. So let's see. My, my, my nervousness is like, we're going to do this live and just I hope it all works fine. Because the one gripe I still major gripe I still have with addressables is that sometimes they'll throw an error message and it's very obtuse. It basically just said it broke and it'll give you some like nonsense that doesn't really explain what happened. So that's my concern. It's like, oh my god, if something broke live, it's like, uh, <laughs> this wasn't supposed to happen. No one saw it. Whew. So yeah, so we had a few minutes. Just pretend we're the only ones watching, because I think we are right now. I mean, you probably are. I'm just trying to be polite. And then the people are going to come back and watch the recording, you know? Here's just some pre-roll, so they know to skip. They can just skip to the, what, like, Insert time marker here, mark, where it actually starts. So, aside from addressables, uh, Steve and David, you guys got any interesting new tech you've been looking into? I've been looking into chatbots and AI voice stuff. Apparently, the uh, AI text-to-speech has gotten really damn good. Nice. I've seen some of that and it looks really cool. Clicked on the links that David posted. And I've just been looking at old tech. Not interesting. Hey man, old tech is always interesting. You know, um, it was like one of the John Carmack keynotes. Uh, he's talking about how to optimize for VR. And his suggestion was to look at like the early, like almost like launch titles for the original Xbox 
how they had to optimize things to get stuff to work, to get like inspiration for like weird tricks and stuff you can find out. So I've just been falling down that like my YouTube cycle. So hey, old tech is always cool. That's good to keep in mind. I'll check that out. I think the biggest thing is like it's like how little RAM they had, and even less of it was video RAM. And that's just that's like a precious resource and commodity. It also is what gives rise to like hilarious speedrunning glitches, like the infamous Ocarina of Time, where it's like you open a door, you open a door, you like dump a bottle on the ground, pick it back up, and then the door just warps you to like the final boss. Just because they only had so much RAM, the bottle accidentally overwrites the RAM location for the door. Good shit. All right. So we'll get this started. Let's get going. All right. Addressables. They're easy. They're super easy. Oh my gosh. They're so easy. So I have this scene right here. This is saying it's got a box and a cube and a canvas on it, right? So I'm going to hide this. I have some stuff pre set up for later. So we got our button here, right? It's called show me the stuff. And what's it going to do? Well, it's going to show me stuff. And it's going to do it right now, right? So let's talk about what resources are. Resources are something that's been in Unity since forever. Like this, that's OG Unity stuff. So show me stuff. This is pretty much standard resources. How do I zoom in on this? I guess I can't zoom anymore. Uh, control plus. Plus, there we go. All right, we're in, we're in old person mode. There we go. So this is, this is standard Unity resources right here, right? We have a folder that has a resource in it. Boom. And anything in this folder can now be just loaded from any piece of code anywhere in the game. Doesn't matter if it's in the scene or not. And if you've never used resources before, I'm going to back up a step. You'll probably know that, hey, if you want to load something, you'd have to like drag and drop prefabs onto your scripts. Well, Unity, when you compile your game, it goes through every object, it looks at all the scripts, and it looks for all the prefabs. That's how it knows, like, hey, this scene needs this much data, so I gotta load this into the memory when I load a scene. Cool. Resources is the exception. Unity will just always have this on the disk, and so now anything via code, see, I just it's called stuff. I put my stuff in here, and in code I say resources.load stuff. Get it and make it. Done. Right? This is not addressable. This is how it's always been. And so now I just hit play. Show me this stuff. Boom. Football horse wrestling card. Rad, right? My favorite Magic the Gathering card or something. I don't know. But that one's missing from my collection. Well, it's it's super rare. It's got it's the only card that has NFL sponsorship and it's Romanski fighting a horse. So very controversial card because I don't know, I don't, football or whatever. Anyway, so that's standard resources, right? That's that's how like you so you've probably been using it. A lot of people say don't use the resources folder. The reason for it is it kind of bloats up your game because Unity tries to be intelligent when you make your game. It's going to decide what assets you're using and which ones you are not using. And that's how it decides what to actually like put together for the game's executable. Resources breaks that rule because anything, anywhere can use it. But the usefulness of resources is that you might have something like uh, I don't know, like a predefined, I think we use it, for example, uh, we have a scriptable object that has like player settings in it. And anywhere in the code that can just be loaded up, you know. It's handy for like universal kind of assets. So again, this is bog standard, right? So let's talk about addressables. So I have another thing, show me stuff addressable. Now, if I go to addressable object, I'm just gonna have a prefab right here. And you'll notice if you have the addressables package loaded in, you'll have this little checkbox. It says addressable. You check the box, boom. And this one's called better stuff. And if we go to our asset management addressables groups, whoop. I don't know if it's just me, but I lost a little bit of resolution there. It's hard to oh, no. read text. Shit. My bad on language. Anyway, to make anything addressable, it's just a, it's a checkbox. Default objects are like this, check it, boom, it's addressable. And whatever you put in here is going to be very important. This is the name of the addressable. 
And it's going to show up in this default local group and says, look, I have better stuff, right? So I now go to my code and now I have show me stuff addressable. This is the exact same thing, but look, we have our name, addressables, instantiate async, stuff name, and stuff parent. We actually just got rid of a line of code. This is one line of code, whereas, the, whereas resources takes two lines of code. We have to load it, and then we instantiate it. Addressables, it's one and done. So I have that on here, show me stuff addressable. I changed my button to do it now. Okay, Shrek, before you get too yeah. far into this, try yep. dropping your stream and bringing it back up. Dropping my stream, all right. It Let's cannot see. see anything right now. What? I knew it. Let's see. See. All right, try this. Yes, no. Fingers crossed. I don't know why Discord doesn't like me for some reason. All right. There we go. All right, so back in action. Uh, yeah. Screen. I'm pretty sure it was like 1080p and 30 FPS. Oh, okay, that might be good enough. Okay, you can back up about a minute. And All right. You're good. <laughs> so. I showed you guys the basic way to do resource loading. That's the way it's been since Unity 2014 or whatever. So addressables is basically kind of works the same way, except you don't have to use a special folder. So I have an app, a prefab here it's called better stuff. I check this box, makes it addressable, and I put a name in for it. I'm just going to call it better stuff. And so the code, this is the code for using resources. You know, resource load, I punch in the string name, blah, blah, blah. But this is what it looks like for addressables. It's the exact same thing. It's actually one line of code. Instantiate async will load and instantiate all in one line. Now, the catch is this is asynchronous. Resources.load is synchronous, which means that if for some reason resources.load was like a five gigabyte prefab, it's going to freeze the entire game until it's loaded. This will run in the background and it's going to instantiate it as soon as it's finished loading. So there could be a lag time, but for us, this is going to be really small. So if I hit here, make sure this is set up. Yeah, I do show me the stuff. Boom, our newest card, the evil otaku. So that's an addressable. It's that simple. That's it. Now we're going to talk about a lot more of this stuff, but that's how you use an addressable nutshell. It's basically just the resources folder on steroids. So what do I mean by on steroids? Well, we got a lot more stuff. So there's a few gotchas you could run into like this. So oh, let me try it. What's up? Ah. Again? Uh, it dropped out for just a second. Okay. A little low res, but it's workable. Cool. Well, this is like I'm zoomed in, so this might just be low res because of that. But talk about some no, gotchas. It, it looks like it's like some stream compression. Not sure oh. why. Weird. I don't. Hmm. I don't know. Um. So let me check one thing on. Let me check my router to make and just I'll kick off every other device that's not me on my phone somehow. But anyway, where is here? Yep, optimized for streaming. 
Yeah, I don't know. Blame Discord. <laughs> anyway, there are a few gotchas you can run into with addressables. Uh, and we'll try them here. So with resources, this is kind of normal, right? You know, resources.load. And if anyone ever plays around with game object instantiate, you know you can do this. I can, I'm loading a prefab, but this prefab has a script on it. So I'm saying, hey, give me this script from this prefab and call game object instantiate. And I can show you that works by going over here. Do it now. And run it. Yep, that works just fine. But if I try to do the exact same thing with addressables, so I say, hey, addressables, load asset async card handler, and then, you know, on the, my uncompleted method, instantiate it, it will not work. And this is what's confusing, because it will say there is no addressable here. It will say, what are you talking about? You have the wrong address. This isn't right. Well, I swear to God, if it suddenly just works right now, I'm going to be confused. Nothing. And instead it says, oh, this is wrong. This is, this is an invalid key. And you'll be looking at it like, but my key is correct. I'm typing in the right name. That's because with the addressables, it doesn't save the, the files are indexed by their file type, not by what's on them. So because this is a, on the disk, this is a prefab, it is a game object. That's what's on the disk. And so I can only ever get it to work by using a game object. So then I would, if I wanted to get my card handler script right here, I'd have to load it up and then do game object dot get component. So this will work fine if I do it this way, just to prove I'm not full of it. I have do it right. Works fine. So what's going on is if I'm gonna bring up the group window, so if you go to addressable group window, this will show you all the assets you have addressable. And you can actually see their file type right here. And the thing is, it's just like, this is just a game object. Unfortunately, the current version doesn't tell you, it just has the icons. So from this, it's a game object. That's the only way you can get it. They do this because they don't check the name for uh, isolation. So you could have better stuff as a game object and then better stuff as a sprite and better stuff as a texture. And so you would have to specify, are you trying to get the better stuff texture, the better stuff object, whatever, whatever, whatever. You should never really do that. That's kind of a bad idea to have multiple things share the same name. So I'm not gonna show you that, but you shouldn't do it. So, David once said strings are the devil and I do agree with him. So let me show you easier stuff. I've shown me stuff and this is easier stuff. The way easier stuff works, Uni doesn't even really want you to use strings to work with addressables. They want you to use asset references. And it's just an opaque object, and it just plugs and plays. But what's really nice about that is in the editor, you now have a dropdown of every addressable object you have in your project. So you're not having to like worry about typos. You're, oh, I changed the name. I need to go through and update all my scripts. It's just, nope, she's got it and it just works. That's it, like that's addressables in a nutshell. Super easy. As for why you'd want to use addressables, there's advantages with memory. Um, so for example, if I, had a, if I had some object or whatever, and I, you know, I slapped this texture on it, ah, whatever. So I went to this object, I don't know, I'm just gonna slap this image on it, or wherever this image lives, there you go, cool. This football card. This will always be loaded into memory, always. Even if I don't need it, even though I had this button hidden off screen. For example, like let's say it was like a pause menu. I had this image here. If 99% of the time the game's not paused, well, this is just wasting memory space, you know? But if it's an addressable object like here, it's not loaded into the memory until we request it. And then whenever we stop using it, it gets unloaded from memory. So it could just free up space. That's convenient. Um, let's see, I have my cheat sheet list of what I should talk about. <laughs> da, da, da. How do you destroy, yeah. how do you release it? 
Oh yeah. Uh, you can either let it automatically happen just by like garbage collection, uh, or if you have your asset reference. So what this returns right here is an async operation. And then when it's done, you could just do async operation dot, oop, wait, is it stuff? Yeah, sorry, other way around. This asset, whatever your asset reference is, there is a release asset command. And this will unload it from memory. Now, I caution you about that. It's uh, be very careful about that. You make sure there's nothing in that asset that you need anymore because it will be gone. And um, case in point, um, come on, should I let it compile? So, and I will show you what I mean by that. So, um, here, let's just do it live. We're gonna make a script, we'll call it, I don't know, texture example. Because this is a problem that bit me in the butt uh, the other day, and I had to learn this the hard way. So I'm just going to make a scriptable object, and I will just call it texture example. Whoop. Cool. Oh, whoops. I already did. Cool. And what's this got on it? It will have a simple texture. And we'll just, I don't know, sample texture. You can just mark a texture as addressable. You can just do that. In my case, I had some scriptable objects that had just, I don't know, we had a whole bunch of data where it was, um, I can't talk about it, but we had a whole bunch of strings like, oh, this is, I want to make up an example. This is a car and this is the car's stats and its mileage and blah, blah, blah. And the last thing was a picture of the car. So we had a texture in there. So whatever. So that's why we were just, we were marking the scriptable object as addressable and not just the single texture because it was all one big data bundle. And where is my, what's important thing for any scriptable object is this one line right here. This is what lets you make it. So, cool. So what we're gonna do here, let's go to prefabs. We're gonna create scriptable object, texture example, cool. So just real quick, if there are addressables, yep. they don't have to be in the prefabs folder, right? That's just our- They can just be anywhere. Yeah, they can be anywhere. Okay. Um, anywhere you want. The only catch is they cannot be in the resources folder. And uh, actually, if you have something in here and you make it addressable, Unity will move it. It'll say resources underscore moved. I just, just for the sake of cleanliness in the project, I'm just putting stuff in here. So let's slap this, let's, let's slap this Divot card in here. My favorite trading card right there. Cool. And we make them addressable, whatever. So, we're going to do this. We're going to make a like an image. Doesn't really matter. And now let's make something. We're going to call it texture breaker because that's what it's going to do. It's going to break this texture. So let's see. Blah, blah, blah. We'll make another button. And change the name, we'll call it break stuff. Bingo. And break stuff. Go to our break stuff. All right. Here's the scariest thing, folks. We're going to do some live coding. So so anyone ever knows, it's like whenever you have to show off code, the how bad the code breaks determines on how, who is watching. So if it's your friends watching, it'll work fine. If it's your boss watching, it's not gonna break. If it's your boss's boss watching, not only what's not gonna break, the computer will catch fire. If it's your three bosses up, you're probably just gonna have a heart attack. So just so you know, FYI. All right, so and, we got uh, this. What's that using statement you put in there? Oh, this is addressable assets, so. 
We can only read the yellow text. Weird. I don't... Huh. Well, anyway, I, I have to import the engine.addressable assets. Uh, I'm, using, I'm just going to make an asset reference for, you know, texture example. So here's the fun thing. Scriptable objects, remember what I said that with a prefab, it can only be a game object. Scriptable objects get to break that rule. And so we can actually do this. We're going to say texture example. And this will actually just work. We can actually instantiate it as a scriptable object because the way Unity writes it to disk, it is a texture example file. So we're going to say public void, show stuff and break it, show stuff. And what we're going to do is we're just going to load it up. And because I'm really lazy, I'm going to make this async. So I'm going to make this async. Async and await is an amazing c -sharp feature that Unity has started using with addressable assets. So normally with addressables, you'd have to use callbacks, and that can get kind of sloppy and messy. But now I can just do this. So I'm going to say addressables dot, say load, load asset async texture example. We're going to feed it the texture example. And then I just do this, dot pass. So now I can say texture example to e equals await. And that's it. Now I just I just have it. And if you've never used async and await before, what this does, this keyword await says like, hey, I know you're going to return an async operation handle, but I don't really care. Just I'll just wait. I'm just going to wait for it. And when you mark your method as async, that just means like, hey, this method might not complete instantly. So this essentially like lets the compiler put in a bunch of boilerplate code. So instead of having to like make a callback or do an inline or however you want, I just I can just I just get to pretend as if I already got it. And what really happens is that when Unity processes this, it just pauses. But I don't have to code like that. I can just pretend willy nilly as if I have it instantaneously because we're lazy. So you would so do cool. this like, instead of like a coroutine. Yep, yeah, like instead of a coroutine or instead of a callback. Um, cause, uh, it's just like, it's just a preference. There's pros and cons to using async and await there. For example, if you're using async and await, you can't really do like a loading bar, right? Cause their code just pauses until it's finished. Whereas if you use a coroutine, you could have, you could check the status of the addressable object, which would be really handy if it's like, you know, five gig file, you could show a loading bar as it brings up. Where, but you know, then you have that mess of I got to start a coroutine. I have to do my yield return, yield return, wait for blah blah blah, all that other boilerplate. But if you don't care, you can just say screw it, await. The only other, there is some weird gotchas with this, but that's kind of out of scope for this talk. Just play around with it and just watch. As sometimes you'll stop playing the scene, and then your code just says I don't care, I wasn't finished. All right, so we got our thing here. Cool. And what we're gonna do is. We're going to take that UI element we had. So I got to import UI. And we'll just make a reference to it. So I'm image. All right. So we need to go uh, some image dot sprite equals texture dot. Whoop. What is it? It is it's sprite dot create. My bad. Sprite dot create. So we'll say te dot sample texture, and we were gonna say uh, blah 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 new rect. We we're what height width width height. Whoop. Have you ever done this before? What this is is Unity treats sprites as a subsection of a texture. So I'm taking a texture and I'm creating a sprite from it on the fly. So I could actually, I could have just made my object be a sprite straight up, but this is the way I ran into the bug. Uh, Cause we had certain objects that would use a texture and certain ones that used a sprite. And this is, I'm recreating the bug I found. So if you're saying like, why are you doing this? I'm like, there's a lot of other stuff I had to do for reasons. So dot height. Oh, this is X, Y width height. Whoops. 
So I've just been, so blah, 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 creating a sprite, cool beans. And so your texture is like your sprite sheet, but you're using the whole thing. Yep, exactly. What are you not liking here? No real method for create takes two arguments. I promise I have more. Uh, oh, that's right. I got to do vector 2.0. And that's fine. Now it should be fine. All right, cool. So this will work. I say that as if I, I know for sure. Cool. So we have our example asset here. Cool. And we have our image there. Cool. And we got our break button. This is our break button. And wire up our method. And we're going to say break stuff. So this is going to work. I promise this will actually work. Break stuff, show stuff. Keep. Can you give me one more promise? No, because this is not JavaScript. We don't do promises here. Async await only. Get good. All right, cool. Break stuff. Yeah, look. So it worked fine. Cool. So I know I said, hey, we're going to break it, and everything worked. Well, now I'm going to talk about labels, because that's involved in this giant spaghetti mess. And do you even want to know about labels? So let's go to my addressables. I'm going to go to my groups. So I got my... A better stuff card, my example asset, All right? Let's make a label here. We'll call it call it a ultra label. That sounds rad. Everyone should have rad label names. Ultra label. What labels do is that they, if you don't have like a specific thing, you're saying like, hey, give me all of a thing. So let's say I had a whole bunch of you know, playing cards. I could have a label that says, you know, playing card, and then I can say load assets playing card, and instead of getting one, I now get every single asset that's tagged with playing card. And that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to tag my example as ultra label, and that's fine. And I'm going to go back here and say, all right, instead of this, instead of this, which we saw worked, we're going to do this now. Like asset label reference the label. Right, cool, cool, cool. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna say addressables. Uh, load assets plural async texture example, and we're just gonna punch in the label, and we're gonna set this in the Unity editor. You can technically make a label object at runtime, but it's not as simple as just playing a string. You have to create an object, set the string type, then pass it in, and just don't. Let's see. Oh yeah, so this always wants a callback. So we say, hey, we have our callback here, and then we'll, we'll say process callback. So this is nice. So what this does is that it's gonna call our, call our method. Process callback. What is the type it wants? It wants. What are you wanting? Yeah, a texture example. Yeah, I got it. The. Cool. So, what it's going to do is it's going to grab every single asset that has this label and it's going to pass each of them one by one into this method. And the really nice thing about this is it doesn't wait for the rest of them to finish. So let's say I had 300 assets. As soon as it finished asset one, it passes it to this, and then the addressable system goes and starts loading asset number two. So it's it's all asynchronous. It's not like it doesn't wait for all 300 to finish. It just, it does them as soon as it gets them. That's really nice. So anyway, I'm gonna move this down here. And, oops, PE. There we go. So we're going to load it. It's going to do it. Cool. And this doesn't have to be async, async anymore. We don't really care. So we're, because this is going to pass this callback as we finish things. That's really nice. So let's make sure this still works. So let's make sure this hasn't broken already, because if it does, I'm going to panic. But it should just be fine. Oh, it's not going to work because I didn't sign the label. There we go, the label. And look, there's all of our labels. Ultra label. The best label. Ultra. Better than super, it's ultra. Cool.
cool. Look, it worked. Now, obviously, if I had a bunch of ultra labels, it's going to just overwrite them, right? Kind of silly. Here's where things can get kind of weird, though. Um, and this might not work on my machine because I have only one, one item. And in my test case scenario, I had 50 items that broke this. Whoa. Whoa, calm down. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to grab the async operation, right? And async operations have a completed. And this is the method, the callback that will fire when this has finished. So we're going to say, all right, cool. We're going to add, you know, we're just going to do this inline because, you know, we're just kind of ballers like that. It's fine. So say, hey, when this is fi finished, well, we don't need it anymore, right? So we can just say, hey, just release it, right? Right. Dot, whoop. Where is my handle? Where is my handle? I promise I had it. There it is. Task. Task dot release. I swear to God, it's in here somewhere. The release method for a fleet. If it's the label, I'm going to freak out. I have my work laptop like side by side of my regular computer just so I can confer with the notes of like what broke and where did it break. So I'm double check that. How did Jonathan screw this up originally? The story. Let's see. So what's going to happen though, I'm trying to explain this while I look at the code. But what happens though is that this completed method fires the moment it finishes downloading all the assets. It does not fire after they have been processed. So this can actually fire before this does. And in the case I ran into at work, let's see, list, ah, here we go. This is the right method. I don't know why I keep trying to call release on the, on the handle itself when it's actually this, addressables.release async op. Bad. So this is bad. It might work, it might not. In my case, the label I was pulling down had 50 assets into it. And I tested like, oh, look, it works, it's fine. But I didn't check all 50 of them. In our case, we're using augmented reality to do stuff, and this is loading in experiences. So I was like, oh, that's weird that that didn't work. Oh, it must have just been the AR was acting up. Because if you ever worked with augmented reality, you know, sometimes it just doesn't want to play nice. But this is, in short, what we were doing, and this is what broke. We're going to see if this breaks. It, I have a feeling this is going to work fine, but <laughs> don't trust it. See, this worked fine here. The reason why this worked fine here is because it's one asset. And because it's loading off my machine, it's not loading off of a remote server. So this was this loaded ran instantly before this could. Now I don't have 50 assets in an Amazon server sitting laying around to simulate this. But just so you know, this is bad. Do not do this. <laughs> Super bad. The way we eventually discovered this is what was occurring is that we put a timestamp. We had it, this timestamp out to the log. We just put in, you know, debug.log completed, you know? And then we just, all of our, we had this at the very beginning, which was, you know, started processing. And so what we expected was we'd look at our console and we'd see 50 started processing messages and then one completed. But what we saw is that we saw 20 started processing, completed, and then 30. And the last 30 of the ones that just didn't work. And it was always semi-random where it happened because it was always, it was we're downloading from a remote server. So it was just the speed of your connection. So in my case, when I tested it one time, I'm on Comcast and Comcast, as we can tell from Discord tonight, is just awful. And so, it take, so I had plenty of time to process these sprites. But sorry, the texture breaker didn't actually break textures. But just know this, this, this will fuck you up. <laughs> this is bad. But okay, that's addressables in a nutshell. Um, now I can move on to like talking about how to do content updates with it, which are also super easy. Before I switch gears into that, uh, Steven, Diva, do you guys have any questions or is there questions from the peanut gallery? Uh, we are all good for right now. Cool. Do you guys personally have any questions? 
think it all makes sense. Yep. Yeah. I'm wondering why you would not use an address bowl now that you have this power. Ah, ha, 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 ha. That's an excellent question. Um, so, uh, there, there's weird reasons why. And part of it becomes the way the data gets managed. Um, let me do, I know of a way I can show. Let me do this. Let me go down here. Boom. Cool. It's got this cube. It's fine. Let's gonna let's do this. Let me add a let me add a quad to it. Give me the quad. There we go. Jesus, you're trying to give a presentation here. I don't have time for these games. All right. So let's say I'm just gonna slap this onto the quad. Boom. Right. So here's the problem. Now this is in the scene. This is like hard. You could say this is like hard referenced into the scene, right? But it's also part of an addressable. Actually, sorry, that card is actually part of an addressable. So what will happen, and I believe this will show it here if I do this. We'll go to my, this font's really tiny, so I'm assuming you guys can't see this. I'm in the addressables groups tab, and there's a tools option. And I'm going to go to analyze. Why do you, I swear, it keeps getting smaller. I'm going to go to Analyze Rules, check for duplicate dependencies. Uh, let me save scene just to make sure. And click Analyze and see if it comes up with anything. Do it you, should. It, do you have streamer mode on in Discord? Um, I don't know what that means, so probably not. Okay. That tries to hide like personal information and stuff. And I think Unity might be triggering it, but oh, I don't yeah, know. It, it goes in triggered. and out. It looks good now, so keep going. I have streamer mode disabled, actually. Okay. But I will do that. All right. So anyway, uh, ooh, where'd it go? Yep, here we go. It flagged it. No, nope, it flagged nothing. I gotta do this. So new build, default build script. Here's a here's a gotcha. You might run into the addressables has its own build system. So before you can build your game using file build, you have to go to addressables and do build, new build, default build. And if you change anything seriously in addressables, those changes will not take effect until you do this. So reanalyze this. And this should get flagged now. Weird, didn't it get flagged? No. Let's just run all these. These are just rules. It's looking for duplicates. Places where Unity detected it needs to mark a texture, or mark an asset for addressable bundling. Um, and it's, there we go. Yep. So basically here, Unity is saying, hey, wait a second here. This uh, ultra rare Divot Magic the Gathering card is marked as addressable. But it's also in this scene. So what's going to happen here if I build my app is that this image is going to get put in there twice. Once for the scene and then once for the addressable. So it's going to be literally two files sitting on the disk doing the exact same thing. That's bad. So that's why you might not use an addressable if it's like, if you have a case where, hey, I need this asset to be hard loaded in the scene, but I don't want to be marked as addressable because then it's going to get duplicated. There are two ways to handle that. One is to not use an addressable. The other way is to make this entire scene addressable. And what you can do with that gets wild. But we're going to touch on that in a second. So I have a brief follow up question. Yes, if, go ahead. Well, maybe brief. So what's I have a so one of the things you can do with resource loading, since it is a string, you can just put whatever you can kind of build a string to create the string that you want, right? So you could yep. do like something random. Is there a way to pick a random addressable of a certain type without loading it? Like pick from the list of addressables? Uh, like, do you get uh, a list? Can you enumerate them before without loading them? That is a good question. Uh, so like, that's the thing is you can, with addressables, you can do the same thing with a resource where you can build a string and load an address. However, to just blindly say, give me a random addressable from it. I 
uh, might be possible. And here's where we're going to do this. Something really important to note. Whenever you have questions about addressables, go to your, don't go to Google, go to your package manager and choose view documentation. The reason why is that addressables have changed wildly over like the last year or two. And it's starting to settle down now. But like you'll if you just Google it, you'll find like documentation from version 0.2, which completely contradicts the documentation now. And we're going to go here because we're going to say, hey, I believe if you do the catalog. So the addressables has an internal data file called a catalog that is basically just a giant index of where every addressable is. And I don't know if you can just blindly query it. But you might be able to. Let's see, where's my remote API? Come on. Scripting API, there we go. So I believe if you pull up the catalog, you can do provide, release, blah, blah, blah. You might not be able to. Uh, let's see. Here we go, yeah. There's a list of all the internal IDs for your addressable assets. Um, now the catch with internal IDs, they are not that nice and string. It's not stuff and better stuff. It's not the string name you gave it. That's like a hash number, basically. Um, I don't quote me on it, but I think you could take that and then like reverse engineer it to figure out what the string it is. Um, it might be like provider ID or some provider IDs or something. So you could, in theory, find a list of all the addressables in the project. And then you could like, you know, pick a random index. As for why you'd want to do that, I don't know. <laughs> well, I was curious if like you had a, like let's say you had a, an addressable type that's like a card type and you wanted to pick a random card of like a hundred different ones and then just load it, but not load all the cards in order to determine which one you want to load, if that makes sense. Actually, yes. Uh, I actually have an example prepared for that. And it's going to be part of, Part of my web talk with content. So I'm gonna move into that segment. So let's talk about content Great. updates. So content updates, AKA what if you wanna provide new content for your game, but you don't wanna to have to send out a new build, a new executable or whatever. So that's where addressables are really handy because what are you even doing here, asset store? Get, get out. Go my groups. So by default, you have this default. <laughs> this window is going off two monitors. Calm down. Sorry, Uni's just excited. Anyway, the default local group. When you click on it, your inspector will show up and it'll say, yes, this is local build path, local load path. That means it's going to get bundled into your game, right? But I made a new group called online stuff. And it's marked as remote, which means this is going to go live on a server somewhere. So as for the, what URL it uses, you have to go to profiles and <laughs> Uni cannot decide whether it wants to be fat or skinny today. And you have your profiles and this is the local path and you probably are never gonna mess with this. The only thing you wanna touch is the last, this last one. The remote load path, that's the URL. Default is localhost. And I have set up a new one here called GitHub. I'll talk about that one in a second. But we're gonna go default, we're gonna set that true. So this is gonna look on my local host for these files. So there is a thing, a tool in Unity that it does not properly explain to you how to use, called hosting services. You go here, you create local hosting, and then check this box, boom. And now what it's gonna do is it's gonna spin up a little tiny server on your computer to pretend to be a remote server. So now you can actually test builds of your game on your computer. Here's why I say this doesn't explain well what's going on, is that from here it's obvious, like, hey, it's hosting this data. But if I go back to my profiles, you know, it just says, hey, it's local host build target. If you just try that, it's not gonna work because it's gonna look for a port number. And you're like, well, do I punch in 58510? You could. Or you could do this, another great feature they just try not to tell you. 
you, you may or may not be able to see there are brackets and curly braces over here. Those are variable substitutions. Unity will inject whatever that data should be. And this is a variable, hosting service port. So we're just gonna type that in. You bracket, hosting service port. Cool. So it's gonna, at runtime, it will swap in this number in here and build target, which is, where are we? Boom, this right here is standalone 64. Currently, and addressable is 1.17.17, what I'm on, uh, this does not work for me for some reason, depending the build target. I have to just let it go blind like that. I don't know why that's the case, but it is. So now if you tried this, you'd be like, well, it's gonna work, right? No, it's still not gonna work. Here's why. These profiles don't actually get updated into your project until you do a new build. So we gotta do new build to update that profile. Cool. But we didn't actually put anything in there. So let's move, we're just gonna drag drop better stuff in here. And guess what, it's still not gonna work because I just changed it. So I gotta do another build again. And yes, this is what you have to do. Now, if you, you might say, hey, wait a second. I didn't do a new build, but it worked fine. That's because your play mode is doing this, asset database. That's where Unity just pretends to go to a server. It doesn't actually do it. The danger with this is that Sometimes there, your code will work perfectly fine, but it doesn't actually work. It won't work properly. Um, that's why you always want to try to use existing build when you need to test things. This will tell it to actually go to the server and grab it. And we shouldn't have to actually rebuild for that. So we have better stuff here. Cool. So we should be good to go there. Good to go there. Oh, let me go here. My canvas, I got my button. Show me the stuff. And I believe I have a, I believe show me easier stuff actually is, yeah. So here's the thing, I don't have to do anything special. I don't have to tell this code here that it's online or local. I don't have to know, I don't have to care. I just say, hey, it's there, go find it. And it's like, all right. So I'm gonna say, hey, got my button. Set this back to show me easier stuff. Do it. And fingers crossed, this works. And I don't have a firewall issue happening in the background with Discord and stuff. Boom, look, it worked. And yep. And you can see in the console, there's the server. The server just said, hey, this thing just reached out and downloaded this file. So Unity sets up the hosting services to let you do really complex things. Like you could run this on an actual, like, server like amazon server if you wanted to to do some crazy wild thing that's a lot of effort i don't really know or care long story short when you do your build script i'm going to where is it yeah this is wrong folder when you do your build script it generates a new folder out in your project called server data you just drag and drop this into whatever file server you have because inside is all these bundle files that Uni will download. It's that simple. In fact, it's so simple, you can actually kind of cheat Discord and do it, I mean, cheat GitHub and do it with GitHub. And let's see if I can make this work. Um, so this project is on GitHub and I will pull up a link in the other window, just in case where it is. So GitHub, if you don't know, <clears throat> allows you to put a website branch in your repository. And it will, oh, here it is, wrong, there it is. So this is the, this is the main branch. This is, this entire project is online right here. Um, we're gonna post this link somewhere. But I had made a side branch called server data. And it's, all it is is this folder and this file. So, to do this, you just make your branch, put your stuff in there. Then you go to your settings, your pages, and you say, hey, make this branch a website. And it says, all right, boss, I got it. And it's just basically a plain file site. So if I go back to here, go back to asset management, I'm going to say, hey, use my GitHub URL. Set this active. 
I'm going to say, go back to my addressables groups. I'm going to say, do a new build. Save and continue, yes. And so are you saying we can use GitHub to mine Dogecoin? No, because it is just a plain file server. It doesn't do anything fancy. But in our case, that's that's all we need to host these content updates or to host content, period. So do your build, save and continue. What is it not? That's oh, I have my scene running. Whoops. No one saw that. No one saw that. There we go. Well, now I'm paranoid. Make sure <laughs> Unity didn't like undo everything. Okay, yeah, we're set to GitHub. Cool. We do a new build. Default build script. And we wait as it panics. Cool. Built. Done. So we have our. So I have server data folder right here. And then I have a duplicate branch checked out to here. So I'm just going to say, all right, cool. Drag, drop, copy, paste. Bada bing, bada boom. Let's open up Git. And we're going to say, Looks like my previous build, I did a 32-bit build somehow. That's fun. All right, so say git stage, everything, it's fine. Git commit, file update. Cool, cool, cool. Now the, the git website protocol might take a minute or two to update. But we can always just try it right now, just see what happens. So hit run, hit show me the stuff. Let's find out. Good hey, look. There we go. And it just downloaded it from the remote server from GitHub. Boom. So what you can tell is like, yeah, you can see this console message here of my local host, but you see it says it's hosting it, but we never got a message that it downloaded it from my server. So that means it downloaded it from GitHub. And there you go. That's how you could easily do that. Now to answer your question about like, hey, what if I had like a random file or something, you know? And I'm gonna combine that with, uh, hey, what if I do need this image in the scene, but I also have an addressable? Well, let's go and do something weird. Let's do this. We're gonna take this whole scene and make this entire scene addressable like that. Boom, sample scene, fancy. We're just leave it as that, I don't care. So now we go to our build list. Uni has automatically removed sample scene from here. And that's fine. So now what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna make a scriptable object and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be really lazy with it. I'm just gonna call it asset list. And what's it do? It's just got a list of asset references and that's fine. So I made a scene called preload. This is the very first scene Unity will load up and in it, it's gonna load a scene, cool. So this would normally load our sample scene, but you know what, we're just gonna ditch this. Get rid of the U. So instead, we're gonna say, let's see, load scene list. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make a script that is going to load that scriptable object we just made. And you might be like, but Jonathan, why? I'm like, oh, that's right. I forgot to explain why, but you and I'll see. I'm gonna add in addressable assets. Cool. And then this is going to be public asset reference. This is a scriptable object. I can just type it like that, asset list. And I'll say, hey, scene list. Cool. I'm like, but Jonathan, what, why are you doing this? I'm like, oh, yeah, well, let me show you. Come on. So I go back to here. This is a, not that. Go back to my prefabs and say create scriptable object asset list. Let's call it scene list because I like the name. Cool. Make it addressable. And let's make this. Uh, we're going to add in this scene, sample scene, because now we can we can actually load scenes with addressables, just like that, just like you would normally. But now it's addressable. And so what I can do, if I go to asset management addressables groups, I can just say hey we can just make this seamless on our server. And just for kicks and giggles, we can even move this scene to our server. That's fine too, but we'll leave it where it is. 
And so now we'll go back. So we said, hey, we got our seamless, cool. We're gonna say, uh, let's see, addressables dot load asset async asset list scene list and let's just do some kind of inline an inline callback it's the devil i know but hey man it's how i roll sometimes inline callback why are you not liking this oh it's an error Anyway, so we're gonna say, hey, where's this is all I'm doing an inline callback. So this method right here about the right is gonna get fired when this loads. And we're like, cool. So we got this scene list, right? And we know that the uh whoop, asset list and call it SL equals our async operations. Whoop. S whoa, what? Where are you? Oh, oh, this is the SLS. I'm stupid. My bad. I'm used to dealing with lists of things. So uh, SL. There we go. So SL, we have we know it has a list of asset references. And we're just gonna get the first one from the list. We're just gonna blindly do this. You know, who cares about index out of bounds? That's fine. Yeah. So asset reference first scene equals this. Cool. So now we have the the reference to our first scene, and then we're going to go, hey, addressables dot load scene. It has a special load scene async method that you have to use for scenes. Load scene async, and we're just going to say first scene, and it has a built-in activate on load priority, blah blah blah, the standard stuff. Cool, and we'll just do that. So now we slap this into our scene after it compiles. Whatever gets around to that. So, oop, there we go. We say load scene list. We'll set our scene list. Save. And, oops, let's go here. Because we're testing this, I don't want to have to bother like pushing this up to the server. So, I'm going to switch this back to asset database mode because that's just, it just pretends. So there we go. And uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, I always got to do new build because we were tweaking stuff. You can do it, I promise. There we go. So now, boom, look, it looked, it worked. So, wow. It just loaded that from a fake remote server in our case. So now it's like, all right, cool. So I just, I decided this, I just, I don't know why I hit play so fast. I double clicked it. I got excited, but yeah. So now it's here, cool. So here's the cool thing about making a scene addressable. So you remember earlier we put the, um, the ultra evil otaku trading card in our scene and Uni was like, hey, wait a second here. This is a duplicate asset. Well, if we put it in a addressable scene, it's fine. Uni will say, hey, you're going to have a duplicate, but we can just fix it for you. And you just check a box and it will shuffle the assets around. So it's not, no longer an issue. So, so let's do this now. Let's do this. Let's show how to do an actual real update. Let's turn this back to localhost. Uh, let's see. Set active. Cool. Set active. Boom. And new stuff. We got our cool. So here's the thing to note, right? This uh, sample scene, this is actually marked as being local. It's gonna be built into our game, but our scene list is gonna be marked as online. And if this works, it's gonna be really cool. But if it doesn't, well, then I'm sorry. So we're gonna do a new build. We build our assets out. This creates all the files in that server data folder. Cool. And then we're gonna to go to build settings. Let's make another build. That's cool. Build. And do a pentagram to make it go faster. Don't ask why. This just works, promise. See, look how fast it's going, Jesus. Oh, see, I stopped doing it. It froze. <laughs> All right. So 
Now let's double check. This is our build right here. We're gonna run it. I hope this doesn't screw up Discord. I assume you guys can see it launched up and everything. And look, it it worked. It loaded the scene. Show me the stuff. There's Evil Otaku. It's great. All my hopes and dreams. So now we're gonna do this. We're just like, hey, wait a second here. Do you know what today is? Guys, does anyone know what today is? Very important day. Well, this is where, let's say you publish this awesome game and suddenly they go, duh, comrade, it is Slovenia army day. And you say, yeah, what we need is Slovenia flag and better accents, but better accents are outside the scope of this talk. So we're just gonna throw in the Slovenian flag. So now we can have a holiday. It's Slovenia flag day. That's cool. But you already built your game. You don't want to do a whole nother executable. So then what you do is this. Whenever you make a new build, a little folder gets popped into your project. It'll called Windows or Android or whatever the platform is. And it generates this. Addressables content state. This is basically a log of where all the addressables are and their files are. So this is very important. So this this is going to be like this file right now is like this is a list of where all the files are with the last build of the game I just shipped out. So I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to update a previous build and it's going to ask for this file. So we give it this file. So now it knows that it's like, hey, we got some updates here. Whoop. Oh, I forgot to I forgot something. My bad. I forgot one last thing on our online stuff we have to check a box called Build Remote Catalog. That allows you to do remote updates. Probably the most important thing. And, oh, it's in the top level settings, my bad. Let's see, blah, blah, blah. Build Remote Catalog. Build path. Uh, it doesn't matter, say remote build path, remote load path. There we go. That way it looks for it on the server. I gotta do a new build. Cause I changed it. Oh. Because I changed the addressable settings, I need to go and change this back to not Slovenia flag day. I'm sorry. Just so I can show. Uh, default. So we're gonna do so let's try this again. Alright. I was so proud of that joke too. I looked up what today is Slovenia Army Day and I just man. Anyway. I guess that means your boss will eventually see this talk. No. <laughs> I don't know if he does. I haven't mentioned anywhere where I work. And I've like told him all this stuff like way beforehand. He's gotten random like messages from me at midnight. It's like I figured it out. He's like, go to bed. All right. So we built that. Cool. Rebuild this. Yep. Should be much faster. I just went to Google and looked up like what holiday is today and today is Slovenia Army Day. So, cool. Let's check to make sure I did this right. So this should be what we see, a blank scene, red cube, and our Divot trading card. Show me the stuff, boom, cool. The fact that it even loaded up is what's important. All right, so now we're gonna go back to here. We're gonna say, all right, cool. It is now time for Slovenia. So we're going to go update previous build, and we're going to go to Windows and say this. And we're going to say, all right, open. And it's just going to do some stuff. Yeah, save and continue. Going to say, hey, we should get a message saying build completed. Whether that's our build or not, I don't remember. But now, fingers crossed, I didn't screw this up live, as is always the case. Oh, oh, it's loading. Come on, you can do it. I believe in you. Maybe not. I don't know. If the stream is black, that's currently what's happening on my screen, too. <laughs> what happened? Let's find out. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. That was supposed to work. <laughs> I knew it. I knew all my attempting fates with jokes was going to happen. So... What we just did, we just pushed an update out and it should have worked. So let's see, play mode script, use existing build. This will pull from the server. And let's diagnose what happened. See, this worked fine. 
We just pulled from the remote. Yeah, it even says pulled from remote server. Weird. I don't know why. That broke live. I don't know. I'll have to diagnose that later. Anyway, what I was trying to show was like, all right, this is how you do an update. But more importantly, what you can then do, since we'd use a scriptable object, I could just make a whole bunch of these scenes, and then I could say, yes, load this as a scriptable object, and then pull a random number from this list to answer, Stephen, your deck of cards question. So this could be how you could add or remove or rearrange scenes after the game's already shipped. Now, the one big ultra-huge caveat. Um, once the game has been shipped, code cannot be updated. Code can never be sent via content updates. Uh, content updates can contain literally anything except new code. Now, I can add scripts to it. That's fine. But if I try to add a script that wasn't in the original build, it's not going to work. Now, as for why, why it works in the editor but not in the, in the uni thing, let's do this. Again, let's diagnose some stuff live. Let's find out. So for anyone that doesn't know this, uh, all your logs get shoved into app data local low. And let's see where it put them on my project settings. Default company, best company. Default company, let's see. Let's see, MGD addressables lesson. That's what we're doing. So let's see what happened in our log. Let's see if we can diagnose what happened live on TV. Object reference not set to an instance of an object. Neat. Let's see. Couldn't be loaded because sample scene.unity could not be loaded because not been added to, or the asset bundle has not been loaded. Neat. So probably what happened here is this. But our load scene list, we said load assets async this, load scene async. So probably what we need to do is this. Let's do this. Addressables dot load asset async. And we're going to do this for a scene. And whoop. Wait. Oh, it wants a callback. Uh, oh, it just should be a Unity scenes. Scene. Oh, I'm missing an import. Using Unity engine dot scene management. Be a scene. There we go. It's a scene. Yep. Dot Unity file. All right, and we're just going to do the exact same thing here. <laughs> We're just going to say, hey, when this is finished loading, async op, async op dot on complete, say dot completed, uh, whoop, S bike, get out of here. So here's the thing, uh, I'll have to double check the documentation on this. But I'm betting what's happening here is that this does not download the scene. This does. Um, so I'm betting this is like, yeah, this this has to assume that this scene has already been downloaded. So this is probably what's going on here. We're going to give this one more shot, but if it doesn't work, then I'll just call it quits for tonight because we're, we're almost at 7.30. So on completed, S is, let's see, dot result. We don't really care what what it downloaded. We just needed to have it downloaded so it's there. So we're going to say cool. So now we should be able to say load scene async. Let us find out if this is the case. One last chance to fix this live, redeem myself. Something, something, I don't know, insert, insert catchy rap song in post-production. That itself is a joke, because as Diva knows, we don't have post-production. All right, let's test this one more time. We'll set this back to default. Boom. Dress goals, new build. Rebuild this. Cool beans. Go back to our preload, make sure. Yep, set to our scene list asset. Our scene list. <laughs> we don't really need all these, but it's fine. <laughs> it's the same thing over and over again. So now we just do a new build, blah, blah, blah. 
All right. Third time's a charm. There we go. Make sure it works. Scene should work. It should load up a scene. It should be blank. Yep, it's blank. And show me the stuff. Yep. So put out this. Now let's try our content update. And let's see. Go to this scene and let us bonus points to anyone that knows why today is Slovenia Army Army Day, because I do. Not because I'm a Slovenia history buff, but just because I looked up on Wikipedia and I was curious. And that's why I wasted half my afternoon reading about it. You just say that it, it was a war that lasted for 10 days. Very efficient war. All right. So we saved the scene. Cool. Update previous build. One more time. Open. Building. So if this was on a remote server, you would just post that assets bin file to to your server? No. You would just the only thing you have to post is the server data folder. Uh, which I don't know where it went. The assets bin is what you need to keep a log of, like in your version control. So for example, if you that way if you ever you send out updates, you can know for certain that this file is correct. If you use the wrong, like for example, um let me give an example. It's typically in Git, your master branch is the version of your game that is currently released out there in the wild. Like that's what's on Steam, that's what's on Switch, that's what's whatever. So you make your build and you put it out there. That when you make that build, it regenerates that addressables.bin file. But let's say you forgot to save it. So you have an old version. Well, if you make a new update, it's not going to work. It's just going to throw errors because the, everyone's Unity client is going to be like, hey, I'm looking for this file and then I'm asking the server for it, but the server has no idea what's going on. So that's just, that file is just like a snapshot of what was the last, it's basically a snapshot of what addressables are bundled into the game and that the game knows about. So that way, let's see. That so way even if, yeah, so even if you posted the new data to your server, the clients wouldn't know about it unless they received that file, the bin file. Not the bin file. So when I marked that um, make catalog external, this is the catalog. It's a JSON hash file. And I think it's just, yeah, and this file is just a list of every addressable that the server currently is serving. And that's what the clients pull from the server to see what they have. The bin file is a list of all the, see this local group here, this is marked as local build path. This means this is bundled into the game. It's not on the server. That bin file is a list of every file that's been bundled into the game. So the reason why that's important is that the scene that we just tweaked and added the Slovenia flag to is actually local. It's already bundled into the game, but we just made an update for it. That update is gonna be on a server now. And so this is that's why it has to tell it. So they're gonna go online and check and it says, oh, wait a second, there's an update I need to download and use. So here's hoping that this works now. Let's see, black screen of death, let's do it. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. I'd have to figure out why it's not loading that scene dynamically. It could be something weird with scenes. But that's all we have time for tonight. So let me try to answer, try to answer that question cool. better. Um, there's two types of addressables come in groups. You make groups. You can make more, as many groups as you want. And there's only two types, though. There's local groups and then remote groups. And remote groups are like on servers and whatnot. Your remote groups, when you build them, are going to have that catalog.json file that has a list of all those assets. Your local groups are technically bundled into the data folder of your executable. It's, uh, I believe it's in here somewhere. Anyway, yeah, it's, uh, it's in here somewhere. I think it's the resources.assets. So the bin file is a list of all the addressables that are 
bundled into the executable. That's why it's really important that you keep track of that bin file. So when you make an update, it can reference like the uni will say, all right, I know which files that they were shipped with that they already have built in. Therefore I can create a Delta of what new files they need. So that's my answer. Now as for why this didn't work, this could be something weird about, it doesn't like me updating a sample scene. This is valid. You can make an update to a local group that was, um, that was built into it. This is valid. The problem with doing that though, is that Uni will not delete this. So let's say I had some like one gig 4K movie in my game, and then I updated it later. They're still gonna have that one gig 4K movie taking up space on their hard drive. And it's just, it's just dead data because they've already downloaded the update that uses something else instead. So generally you need to have a little bit of forethought into what's gonna be need to be updated versus what's gonna be local and be built in. Um, Unity also wants you to change this as your update restrictions. Like both these groups are marked as can change post-release, but you could also mark them as cannot change post-release. Um, as for why, that's just getting into the nitty gritty of like memory management and space. Um, however, Setting this to cannot change post-release is also a lie. <laughs> you can do this. However, you can then run, um, they, have a, they have a, was it? Check for content update restrictions. Will allow you to update this anyway. <laughs> you basically said, hey, I lied. I said this was never gonna change, but I lied. It's gonna change anyway. But right now, if you're just starting out, this is easy peasy setup. There's tons of advanced options to play around with. The only thing I ever recommend uh, people might look into is um, your groups are individual files. So if I open up my server data group, to show what I mean, there is a group called online stuff. If I made a new group, it would show up here. So the problem is what if I had like a billion things? What if I had like 52 custom cards in here? But to go to your example, I only needed to download one. The issue, excuse me, is that it's going to download this entire group when I only wanted one. So that's why you might want to have to be like, sort out your groups. However, if that is the case, there are options um, in your bundle mode. Pack together generates things as one big fat chunk. But then you could do pack separately. If I do this, now we'll see two different files instead of one big fat online stuff. And... Yep, now we see seamless.asset and where's my better stuff? Weird. I don't know why I ate that, but. So, are the, yeah, go ahead. Are the bundles, are they cached offline? Like, or yes. do they check for updates? Yes. Or how does it, like, when you run your client, the client so, doesn't actually check to see if it's changed, or does it just, if it has that cached, it's going to keep using that cache. So uh, the first time you access addressables, um, it, ch it does check for the online catalog file, uh, just, just to see if there's an update with that. And I believe there is, yeah, this hash file, you see it has cat like .json and then .hash. .hash is one kilobyte, it's tiny. It's literally just a number. So it does a quick check to say, Hey, is the number changed? If so, I need to re-download. Otherwise, yeah, Unity does cache it. Default mode is it just, it lives in the cache until it runs out of space. Um, but you also have the option of like clear the cache when you load a new version or whatever. Um, you also have your own ways if you want to manually handle that. You can really get nitty gritty with it. But generally, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, but it, it, I, don't know, yeah. I think they're just trying to cover all their bases for whatever possible use case you could run into. I'm just thinking you were mentioning like if you had a 4K movie that they downloaded that you no longer are using, if you had that set to keep only until the cache version changes or whatever, then it would delete that locally. Correct. Okay. Cool. So they also have other options here. Like this is a uh, like an asset. Like technically, these are asset bundles. And they have ways you can change it to the use like, oh, use a JSON asset provider or text data or virtual blah, blah, blah. I've never messed around with any of that. And so I can't tell, 
they don't have any documentation currently on what those are, and I don't feel like going through their code for something. The default behavior is just fine for me. And again, this is supposed to be like easy peasy crash course mode. If you need to get to the nitty gritty, then you probably already know what you're doing, hopefully. <laughs> so that kind of wraps up my talk. So uh, David and Stevens, what questions do you have for me from you guys? Just like what I may have glossed over or what I didn't touch on or what do you guys have questions with? I'll take that as a good sign. Yeah, no I think um, <laughs> I'm good. So like the, the main takeaway is if you want to have like DLC content stored on an Amazon server or something, all you have to do is just drop that, that Windows 64 folder yep. onto your you know, Amazon bucket or whatever, and then just point Unity to it. Yep. Um, or like if you're doing like a mobile app and you have an iOS and Android build, it'll make an iOS and Android folder and again, drop it onto the bucket. Um, the only other thing you might, the only other gotcha you might run into is if you do, if you're trying to test your builds out, the way we do it at the place I may or may not work because I can't talk about that because blah, 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 is we have, we have the default profile, which is production. That's the actual app itself. And then we have a test profile that points to a special secret test server. And we have a build script. So we have, in Git, we have a master branch and a test branch. And when it checks out the test branch, when it, it changes the profile to use the test server, and then it builds the assets, deploys them to Amazon, builds the app, and sends it to test flight. So that's the only other thing. It's like, you have to be, Uni will append timestamps to the files so they don't overwrite each other but then you need to have some kind of like oh shit why is my amazon s3 bucket like 30 gigs and it's like oh i haven't cleaned anything out and i've done a lot of updates alternatively you can change it so right. unity will overwrite and reuse the same file names over and over again which makes it easy but then you run into issues where you have incompatible mismatched versions so i think you had a question steven Oh yeah, can you deal with like permissions and how do you deal with the request that it's actually making to the server? So the default way it is right now, it's just it's just a plain request. They actually have in their API, and I've not messed around with this because I haven't needed to, but they have an authentication hook that you can do where instead of just silently in the background, like downloading the catalog it goes through an authentication step of your code and you authenticate and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's going to be kind of on you. Uni doesn't really do anything with that other than just give you a hook. And I believe if I still have it pulled up here, they have it marked as blah, blah, blah. Where is it? Oh, they have it in... Oh, come on. Downloadable. Well, I I lied. It's in here somewhere. <laughs> There's um, they talk about how to do an authentication step, but that's going to be custom based on however you have your authentication set up. Um, gotcha. As as far as uh, like there's always a question like how do you, how do you prevent players from like stealing your DLC for free? You know, that's I mean that's a problem that's not an addressable specific problem. Like that's just a, a universal problem. Um, every platform has their own ways to handle that. So like something interesting, for example, uh, Steam and Nintendo don't really like you doing your own content updates. Like they're not going to, Steam won't really care, but Nintendo does. The way they prefer it is that you just make an entirely new build of your game. And when you upload that to their servers, their servers will actually create the Delta patch to download it. So in that case, like worrying about people secretly stealing your DLC, it's just not an issue because it's you never have it remote and everything's local. So as for other platforms, I mean, that's just going to be kind of on you to have some kind of built-in version check. Like, hey, just because we have the DLC file downloaded, do they have permission to access it? That's, again, that's going to be on you and based on what platform you're using. So... I don't, I don't have any direct first-hand experience with that, so I can't give advice one way or the other. 
uh, on the flip side, apparently using addressables makes it really easy to mod Unity games because you can just, if they reveal the catalog like we're doing here, then you can just, it's just plain JSON, so you can tweak the catalog and put your own custom stuff in there. And even Unity themselves will actually recommend, like, if you have a really massive project, you have two completely separate Unity projects, one that just builds the remote content and the other that's just all your code content, and you just use them together. So that way you don't have to deal with a five gig library import or whatever nonsense you got going on. Oh, yeah. So any other like weird off questions or things I may have glossed over? I think, cool, uh, cool, cool. That's it. Yep. Like I said, dressels are like really you. simple and easy to use. Their documentation is just really bad. So yeah. Yeah, it's. I swear to God, like the first time I was trying to use it, I was like, "What do I do with these files? Where do I put them?" And it's like, I finally found some like YouTube video from some guy that was like had five views, and it's just like barely spoke English. Is like, and now you put on Amazon box. I'm like, "What? That's it? You just drag and drop? Why didn't anyone say that? <laughs> it's that simple." So, yep. Yeah. Again, there's a. That's it. I wish I wish I had my cool Slovenia flag to work, but now I'm gonna have to figure out why it didn't. And um, something else, something I didn't touch on. Unity added an option. I think your mic just broke. How about now? Yes. You're no. good. All right. Weird. Um, but yeah, so Unity did add a way to do stuff non-async. And it's, in my opinion, it's kind of silly. But just for example, I'm going to copy paste this. So you got this. Cool. And then you can just do wait for completion. And this will just hang out and just lag the entire, whatever, you don't matter. Lag the entire scene until it's finished, just as if it was the resources.load. The, don't ever do this. This is bad. <laughs> the only time you'd ever want to use this is, let me go back to show me stuff easier. This method right here, instantiate async. If you know 100% that this is already loaded into memory, then you will, that's okay. The reason why is that instantiate async will always wait one frame, even if it's already loaded, even if it's already good to go, it still just waits one frame. That's just part of the async. So doing this will just force it to do it immediately. But if it's not loaded, your entire game will lag until it finishes downloading. And obviously that's not really acceptable. And uh, oh my, oh gosh, I just realized there's one huge major, major gotcha I gotta talk about. I know we're like 740 at this point. So it's possible to have a weird race condition scenario. I'm just gonna do this. So let's say I have some asset I'm trying to load up, you know, and as one does stuff, right? And let's see, blah, 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 asset resource location. That doesn't matter. What are you compl okay, whatever, game object. Anyway, so let's. If I did that twice in a row, it and it's trying to pull it from a remote server, this will actually throw an error on the second one. And what's because it's it throws an error saying that hey, this is already in process. Why are you trying to restart the download process? And so there's there's some checks you can do here. So let's say I don't know if my stuff asset asset reference has been loaded. I can do this. I can do stuff dot, you know, is done. Is it done downloading or not? Cool. But the problem is, even if it's not downloaded, it will still, that will return true. But this is valid. Woo, come on. Is valid will return false. So if this is true and, you know, if this is true and this is false, then no, it hasn't downloaded yet, and you need to call in, you know, load asset async. Well, async, asset async. However, if, whoa, come on. 
However, if it is not done, you know, and, or sorry, it's, if it's not done, but it is valid, that means it is currently in the process of downloading. And then what you can do is this, if you have the asset reference stuff, there is an operation handle. That is what that is what load asset async normally returns. And this will give you the what operation handle is currently being used. And so now I can just do my whole standard like, you know, dot completed plus equals or however you want to do it, yield return, whatever. You know, and finally, you know, you might get an error if it's already done and loaded, you might get an error anyway. Um, for some reason, this is weirdly temperamental. Sometimes I get errors, sometimes I don't. Um, I haven't been able to suss out what's the weird edge case that causes this, other than it definitely does happen. Mm -hmm. So stuff dot is valid. Anyway, so this is to recap. If if it is done but not valid, it's not done. It needs to be downloaded. If it's not done and it is valid, it's currently being downloaded. So then you can just get the handle. If it is done and it is valid, then it's already been downloaded and you can just do this. You can say stuff.operation.result. There you go. That's can you query the progress on the operation handle. Yes, you can. You can do that. Uh, dot percent complete. That's the same thing as process. It's just a float between zero and one. So that's how you would do like a, a loading bar or something. So, and this is, yeah. But yeah, that's this is a weird gotcha. However, if you're using instantiate, this is safe. This will always work. This is fine. It, it's okay. It's it's only happens when I'm messing around with load asset. And I don't it's very much possible that this is just a bug that will get patched out in the future. This might not be intended behavior doing this whole like testing phase right here. Um but for now, just FYI, that's what I've had to do. You can check. It's also nice because like multiple things can have the same asset reference. And if they're already been downloaded, you can just say, all right, cool. Give me the result. And that's instantaneous, you know? That's not like instantiate one frame later. That's it's now. So but cool. But well, yeah, to, to query the progress, you wouldn't want to necessarily wait for instantiate async to finish, right? Uh if you're downloading the progress. You said you would not want to wait, or what? Right. If you're querying the progress, you would want you. If you're waiting on instantiate async, then you're not going to be able to. You don't have a handle to the object yet, right? I believe you do. Let's see. Yeah, you do. Yeah, instantiate async returns a handle. Okay. But that handle is actually it's like um I think secretly it's a static like C plus plus pointer. So any any asset reference has a specific handle that only it has, and that's like global static. So yeah, you can if you're essentially async, yeah, you can check for percent complete on it. And even if you came in from someplace else, you can do it. Now the catch is is like you might want to check this in case you don't want to duplicate instantiation. Because if you call instantiate twice, it'll make two copies. And that's that's working as intended, but it might not be what you intend. So, but that's kind of the, that's how resources.load and dot instantiate work already. But I digress. So, uh, any other questions? I wish this had worked. But, uh, but yeah, I know right now it's like, we've been going for, Jesus, I've been talking for like two hours straight. Feels like it's only been 15 minutes, but half of that was probably just waiting on Unity to compile. But yeah, all right. Cool. Questions, comments. Thank That's you. It. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll post the the GitHub in the description of wherever you're seeing this video, and also cool, cool, cool. on our Discord. Neato. Just about made an inappropriate comment there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I need to update my documentation because I think my my documentation on the GitHub right now has some swears on it. I need to, and I've cleaned it up and expanded it before this talk. So, all right. All your swear words are just acronyms. 
They're sentence enhancers. They provide maximum flavor. Let's see. How do I... 